Listen to the conversation between Bob Wills, who is a foreign student advisor at a language school, and Angela Tung, who is a student, and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions one to eight on the form now. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to eight. Hello, Foreign Student Advisors Office. This is Bob Wills speaking. Can I help you? It's Angela Tung here, Bob. I'd like to make a request for special leave. Can I do that over the phone? Hello, Angela. You can make that request by phone, but I'll have to fill the form out. Let me get the special leave form. Okay, here it is. Hmm. Tell me your student number, please. It's H for Harry, five seven one two. H five seven one two. Okay. What's your address, Angela? I live at ten Bridge Street, Tamworth. Ten Bridge Street, Tamworth, and your phone number? The telephone number is eight one zero six seven four five. Thanks. What course are you doing? I'm in the writing class. Writing. Who's your teacher this term? Mrs. Green. She spells her name like the colour. Thanks. Hmm. When does your student visa expire? Let me look. July fifteen. July fifteen. Okay. Which term do you want to take leave? Do you want dates? First, I have to write a term number. When do you want to take leave? In term one. Okay. Term one. Now, can you tell me what are the exact dates? I'd like to be away May thirty-one to June four. Okay, I've got that. You'll miss four working days between May thirty-one and June four. Is that right? Only three. I'll be away over a weekend. I'll be back at my classes on June five, so that's three days away. Look at questions nine to twelve. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About fifty kilometers from here, near Armadale. Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with May, and I want to spend some time with my mother too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in twelve months. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia.
to a man called Rob, who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Joanne? Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well... Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that... We've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions. But after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. 
So which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5, but it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden. It's over 100 years old, and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest, a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there. That's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north. Then, if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear an introduction on the housing conditions in Chapmanville. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully. Hi, I'm Gavin Murray. I'm the rental manager for the Central Chapmanville Real Estate Agency. I'm a real estate agent, much like any other, in that I help people buy and sell houses. But about half of my time is spent working to assist people in renting houses and flats. I've been in this business for a dozen years now, and I know the city very well, in terms of which areas are the better places to live and how much it costs to rent in these areas. Now, I normally divide Chapmanville into three areas in terms of rental prices. Generally speaking, the area in the northern part of the city is the low end of the spectrum, the cheapest housing. So if you're looking to spend as little as possible on rent, I suggest you look there. The most expensive area would be the eastern part of Chapmanville. Most people think it's the prettiest part of the metropolitan area because of all the hills and parks. As so many people desire to live there, housing prices tend to be quite high. The middle market in terms of price for accommodation is found in the city's western and southern areas. Now, let me give some examples of how much it will cost you to rent in these areas. Let's imagine you're a single person looking for a one-bedroom flat. In eastern Chapmanville, you would be paying no less than $650 a month for such a flat. You won't find anything for less than that. But a lot of people pay as much as $1,100 per month or more. 
The higher priced flats are usually the ones in the hills, which run through the east. They've got the best views of the city. A similarly sized flat in the west of the city and the south, too, for that matter, would cost you at most six hundred and fifty dollars. But there are many flats going for less, and if you look around a bit, you can find one for as little as three hundred and fifty dollars. That's quite a reasonable rental price for most people. If you find that too expensive, I suggest you head to Chapmanville's North, where the cheapest flats are to be found. One-bedroom flats there start from about a hundred and seventy dollars a month and up to about four hundred dollars. Now, for those of you who want something bigger, you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two or three-bedroom house. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. For those of you who want something bigger, you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two or three-bedroom house. That goes for any of the areas I mentioned. Okay, so much for prices. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these areas? Well, I told you that the eastern part of Chapmanville is the prettiest. There are lots of parks and lots of trees all around there. Oh, I should mention that the only public transport in the east is bus. There aren't any trains, so it's not that convenient, as you can imagine. Even though it's richer part of the city, in the south you've also got the river, but you won't find too many parks there because of all the factories alongside the river. In fact, there's quite a bit of industry in the south, which makes it a less desirable place to live. Still, the south is convenient because of public transport. The South has very good train services to the city centre, as well as buses, and that's why a lot of people choose to live there. I said earlier that western and southern parts of Chapmanville are about the same in terms of the price you pay for accommodation. They also have the same sort of public transport services, but the two areas are quite different in other ways. The west is next to the bay, so it's quite attractive in that sense. But there are a couple of problems with the west. One is that the bay is polluted, so polluted, in fact, that you wouldn't want to swim there. I used to take my family there about ten years ago, but now I wouldn't go near it. The other disadvantage of the West is that it is where the airport is, the Chapmanville International Airport. The noise can be quite annoying. Lastly, the North. In northern Chapmanville, as I said before, housing is cheap, quite cheap, in fact, but you pay in other ways. For example, the area is very low and made up entirely of wetlands. It's beautiful in a way, but it attracts an incredible amount of insects for most of the year. The mosquitoes there are really bad. This makes things quite unpleasant, and so few people have any real wish to live there. But if money's a problem, that's the place to go. Just bring your insect repellent. Let me finish by again welcoming you all to Chapmanville and wishing you good luck in finding accommodation and settling down in whichever part of the city which suits you best. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Carey, who will talk about the program in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications, and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student, Edmund Mukala, from the Congo, came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from eight different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of parks development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.